Metroid Prime Hunters made an unprecedented impression on the Metroid community in that its biggest strength is perhaps in its multiplayer mode. Unlike Metroid's previous attempts to make an exciting multiplayer experience, although I still think it can be fun, the players could now choose from seven different bounty hunters, namely Samus herself, Kandon, Spire, Trace, Noxus, Silux, and Weevil, all of which are bounty hunters featured in the main story of the game. Each hunter functions a little bit differently, each with different strengths and weaknesses. That being said, Hunters largely does not have very much name recognition outside of the Metroid community, so it may be difficult for the layman to grasp how each of these combatants function, and so my humble solution for such ignorance is to explain each of the Hunters in Team Fortress 2 terms. For starters, each Hunter basically begins as a hybrid of Scout and Soldier, in that each Hunter has a slower, bipedal form armed with a missile launcher, which has a charge function similar to the Beggar's Bazooka, and a smaller and weaker yet faster alt form. There is technically rocket jumping in this game, although I would not recommend it given the height damage ratio is considerably smaller, and it's only really effective in low gravity areas. As a painless alternative, provided you don't fall from a great height, some maps will include small launching pads at given locations that, in effect, cause the player to rocket jump. Each hunter also has the power beam, a rapid fire weapon that has infinite ammo, and a charge function somewhat similar to both the Cow Mangler 5000 and Scout's pistol. Lastly, all weapons and items that are used in bipedal form can be collected and used by each hunter but can have a different effect depending on which hunter is using them. The items include the Affinity Weapon, which immediately gives the player the hunter's respective specialty weapon, energy orbs for restoring and also boosting health, as if the player were using Medic's Metagun on himself, a temporary cloak making you invisible and ergo akin to spy, and the double damage, which basically causes the player to constantly deal mini crits for a limited period of time. You can also change the setting of the match to replace all weapon pickups with the affinity weapon to accentuate each hunter's unique attributes. Some maps include teleporters as well, although the engineer behind those is on nobody's team. Speaking of teams, teams are optional, although it would appear every player has been hit with Jurati as the team colors are orange and green rather than the standard red and blue. There's also the Omega Cannon and the Death Ball, but there's not really anything in TF2 that are akin to them, so we'll just move on. Samus herself doesn't stray too much from this basic formula, aside from a few details. For one, her missiles, when charged, become heat-seeking, since missiles are her affinity weapon. This means that the player controlling Samus begins each match with a slight advantage. For another, her alt form, the Morph Ball, there are some similarities to Demo Man as well in that it has a boost ability similar to the Tarjan Charge, and can also drop bombs which will detonate immediately if deployed right next to an opponent, or otherwise after a few seconds. Again, similar to Demo Man, these bombs also function as a way for the Morph Ball to gain elevation, albeit by a short distance, but at least no damage is taken in the process. If on a low gravity map, however, not only will this maneuver be substantially more effective, but also, provided enough bombs are deployed properly, Samus can reach the ceiling of the map this way and will temporarily hover at ceiling level, being able to roll and boost to and fro until bombs are no longer deployed and gravity finally kicks back in. Kandon's unique attributes are hard to correlate with anything from Team Fortress 2 aside from his affinity weapon, the Volt Driver, being rather reminiscent of the crit boost and a beam version of the Electric Sapper, and when specifically Cannon uses this weapon, its charged shots will home in on his target and will also cause a blurred vision effect similar to the effect of Sniper's Jurati, only significantly more so. His alt form, the Sting Larva, can attach an exploding tail that homes in on nearby enemies and is capable of launching him into the air, again reminiscent of Demo Man. Yet this also is only truly effective in a low gravity environment. In that case, Kandon too can slow their around the map ceiling, although maintaining altitude with another tail bomb is considerably difficult to pull off, especially if near an opponent, so it's not nearly as indefinite as the Morph Ball's ability. Spire is pretty much a cross between Pyro and Demo Man. His affinity weapon, the Magmal, behaves like a grenade launcher with its shots exploding shortly after landing or upon impact with his target, and when he specifically fires a charged shot with this weapon, the blast will set his targets on fire, 
Unlike Pyro, however, where close range is critical, Spire best keep his distance when igniting an opponent, lest he accidentally ignite himself as well. Similar to Demoman being able to damage himself with his own weapons. Even so, Spire still has some fireproof properties similar to Pyro in that he is immune to lava. Spire's alt form, the Dialanche, a spiky ball in appearance, can also climb walls, rather reminiscent of Demoman's sticky bombs. This form also features a powerful melee attack similar to Heavy's fists in that its recommended use is in cornered situations. Imagine a hybrid of Sniper and Spy. That's Trace. And no, he's not like Tracer. His affinity weapon is the Imperialist, which is a long cascade laser weapon ideal for sniping, and as long as Trace is standing still while armed with this weapon, he will turn invisible. Even without the Imperialist, Trace has a natural cloak while motionless in his alt form, the Triskelion, whose lunge attack is devastating and rather reminiscent of both backstabbing and also getting hit with the charge and charge Islander combo. Interestingly, Trace also has just one eye and a floating head. Unlike Spy's cloak, as indicated, the cloak in either case only works if Trace is standing still, and yet, again, unlike Spy's cloak, the cloak is unlimited. The only exceptions to this limitless cloak are during Prime Hunter or Survival matches. In the case of the former, the location of whichever player is the Prime Hunter is always revealed, so the cloak is effectively useless. In the case of the latter, as long as at least three players remain on the battlefield, the location of any player, cloaked or uncloaked, will be revealed to all other players if that player stays in one place or area for too long. The moment, however, the match is down to two players, called the face-off, the locations of both players will be simultaneously revealed to each other. Again, in either case, the cloak does little more than slightly confuse one's aim. There is also an option during game setup that enables the radar on the lower screen to detect hunters on the map, which can thereby be used to detect even a cloaked enemy. So while the player isn't shown exactly where the opponent is on their top POV screen, like in the aforementioned scenarios, it is certainly a means to narrow down their precise location. In any of these cases, the player controlling Trace would do well to not act too recklessly with their cloak mechanic. Noxus, like Kandon, is hardly a match of any one fighter class from TF2, although his affinity weapon, the Judicator, has vague similarities to any of Demoman's primary weapons in that the shots bounce off of walls, only quicker with no downward arc, with charged shots behaving rather like a beam version of the Spicicle, causing a short-range blast that instantly freezes targets caught within the field. And if there's a cloak pickup on the map that Noxus can get his hands on, this will all the more reinforce this similarity. Although this doesn't instantly kill the target, it does render the opponent both temporarily immobile and defenseless, and ergo easy prey. Noxus's alt form, the Vosythe, sports a blade-like limb that is not only spy-like once again, but also has a bushwhacker-like melee attack, specifically Sniper's bushwhacker because of its ability to inflict critical hits, as well as it having a fire damage penalty, and as a more ice-based enemy, Noxus is not particularly fond of fire. Silux, of all things, is essentially a three-way hybrid of Medic, Pyro, and Demoman. His affinity weapon, the Shock Coil, is a strictly short-range weapon and something like a fusion of the Metagun and the Electric Sapper, the effect being his target loses energy while he gains energy. If the Shock Coil is used successfully for a prolonged period of time, it starts dealing mini crits and ergo also replenishes Silex's own energy at a faster rate, and thus to a certain extent, it also has an ubercharge function. The Shock Coil is also rather akin to Pyro's Flamethrower in the sense that, while it is short range, it requires little precision as its steady, continuous shots immediately lasso enemies within view, making it functionally the exact opposite of the Imperialist and making Silux, like Pyro, the kind of foe from whom you ought to keep your distance. Silux's alt form, the Lockjaw, can also drop two bombs linked together by electrical tripwire, and both bombs can be detonated at once by dropping a third bomb regardless of the third bomb's location, similar to Demoman's sticky bomb launcher and their remote detonation. While these do not cause nearly the amount of damage as that of a single sticky bomb, surrounding an opponent with all three bombs in close proximity can easily cause terminal damage. 
Further, Silux can propel his alt form self through the air using his bombs, and if used properly, the process can be repeated indefinitely, allowing Silux to fly across the arena, especially in low gravity areas. This agile feature, as well as the fact the Lockjaw is the fastest alt form, places Silux as the most scout like among the hunters as well. Finally, Weevil is basically an engineer demoman hybrid. His affinity weapon, the Battle Hammer, is a rapid-fire arcing weapon whose shots have large radii, not unlike Demoman's ranged weapons except for the fact all shots explode on impact and do not ricochet off of walls. Weevil's alt form, the Half Turret, essentially turns Weevil into Engineer as his cyborg body splits into two, with his lower half becoming a stationary automated turret that fires Battle Hammer rounds at nearby targets, regardless if Weevil himself is even armed with the Battle Hammer, similar to Trace's alt form still featuring a cloak, even without the Imperialist. His upper half can then move freely and speedily across the map, attack via melee blows, and collect energy, which will restore energy points to both himself and the half turret, thereby repairing it. This maneuver is also an effective getaway strategy, somewhat reminiscent of Spy's Dead Ringer decoy ploy, making Weevil one of, if not the, slipperiest of combatants. Unfortunately, not only is Weevil's energy split in half and divided between himself and the half turret whenever he engages his alt form, but also he still takes damage even when only the half turret is under attack. Ergo, Weevil too experiences the anguish Engineer apparently does whenever his own sentries are destroyed, as they are metaphorically a part of himself. Sentry down! Only it's not metaphorical in Weevil's case. Although the half turret can't be upgraded like Engineer sentries, collecting a double damage item will also cause the half turret to inflict more damage, and ergo, it will temporarily upgrade it to a faux level 2 half turret. Interestingly, as if to add further to the concept of Candon's affinity weapon being akin to the Electric Sapper, the weapon that Weevil is most susceptible to, and ergo also his half turret, is, in fact, the Volt Driver, similar to the Engineer's sentries being susceptible to the Electric Sapper. Regardless of the half turret's location, or even status, Weevil can combine both halves back together and return to his bipedal form. Although it's not very useful, Weevil can pull off a self-regeneration trick no other hunter can because of his half turret mechanic, and that is even if his half turret is destroyed and his top half is at one energy point, thereby having one energy point once he returns to bipedal form, he can then still return to his alt form with both halves having one energy point, return to his bipedal form again, and now he will have two energy points. Again, it's not very effective given he's still in critical condition and will die from a single hit from any weapon, but it's nonetheless a fun little trick. Ultimately, each hunter has a little bit of soldier, a little bit of scout, and even a little bit of spy and or demo man, which is funny in the lattermost case given demo man rather resembles a pirate, and pirates play a large role in the Metroid series, Weevil being one himself, who also looks like a medieval knight of sorts, and I suppose if you combine all four of these classes together, the result is a bounty hunter. The weapons that liken them further to other classes are available to all players, but the weapons will reach their full potentials and class kinship depending on which hunter collects them. This variety in combatants, weapons, stages, and game modes is what truly makes this game stand out among the other games in the Metroid series, and I hope I have been able to at least somewhat enlighten the layman. That's gonna be it for this episode. Thank you all so much for watching, as always God bless, and I hope to see you all next time. Ciao!